But just before, I just want to do a straw poll. Who, who would say they work for a humanitarian agency who's in the room? Who would say they worked for a development agency? Or is that the same thing? Uh, <laughs> who would, anybody from the private sector? So a few people. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Journalists? Yes, okay. All right, IT specialists in the room? Not, not many. Fascinating. Um, great, so um, over to you. Well, too, I've got a question here while we go around, and we'll, which I'll throw into the mix already f um, from the online. <coughs> John, who's from the UK, revealingly, um, <laughs> says, um, sorry John, um, what advice do the panel have for the role of private philanthropy in technology development and literacy um, as tools for humanitarian effectiveness? Private philanthropy. Paul, you might want to have a go at that. Can you repeat the question, sorry? What advice do the panel have about the role of private philanthropy in technology? Um, well, I mean, I, I don't think it, it would differ uh, in, in, in my answer wouldn't would, would differ if it was just asking for the role of of philanthropy in humanitarian action itself. Um, I mean, I think philanthropy has has an increasingly large role to play, and it's also an area that's d disrupted quite a lot uh, because of technology becoming much more involved in in developing solutions and innovating. Uh, we can think of the likes of the Gates Foundation and, and, and well-known uh, philanthropic bodies like this, which are becoming very, very prominent. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 as my colleagues have said earlier, it's it's really about partnership. I mean, if if the the, the, the multi-stakeholder partnerships from philanthropic, private sector, uh, civil society, academia, um, are what or what's needed. Uh, in order to, to, f to find the best solutions and to reach the best solutions. So I don't think there's any specific role just because okay. it's technology. I mean, it, it could be medical, it could be anything. It's, yeah. Okay, thank you. We've got some questions over here. Hi, my name is Sailesh. I'm an independent. Um, it's a great report. Thank you again for, to the panelists for, for the introductions and stuff. The key question I had was linked to there's a chapter on inf improving information management in there using technology. But I wonder if it might be possible for the different panelists to actually comment on how much information management has been considered. Um, because th it, again, if you look at a couple of, couple of the panelists mentioned Haiti. If you look at Haiti and any of the other major disasters, the key issue with the, with the cluster mechanism has been overload of information in the sense that Yes, great work was done by, say, people like Map Action, who were not necessarily supposed to be providing management information-related in, uh, support, but nonetheless they did, and that saved a lot of agencies from having to this kind of drowning and overload of management information. But it's just management information systems and how how much that could be incorporated better in, into the, in, with use of technology. Okay, great. Um, Nev. This one? Yeah. Okay. Nev Jeffries, um, Head of Humanitarian Policy at British Red Cross. Patrick, uh, at, the, at the end of your speech, began to talk about some of the limits and some of the constraints and some of the caution that's required. I wonder if there are members of the panel who'd like to talk about uh, the introduction of protection into this question, and particularly data protection protection of personal and sensitive data. This is something which uh, obviously some of the private sector uh, have difficulties with, uh, constantly you know, being in court in front of information commissioners for breaches of data protection. So what are the limits to the private uh, <coughs> sector partnership there? And indeed, we're all very familiar with the question of the state and its control of personal data uh, in recent months. So could you talk about that, please? Great. We'll take one at the back here and then gather them up. Solange Fontana, Cambridge. Um, there are two points. I think the point that the training is necessary for humanitarian aid workers, absolutely. Um, 
but there's nothing so frustrating as technological failure. Uh, when you're trying to use technology in the field, I would say maybe not nine times out of ten, but six or seven times there are some serious glitches. Uh, I think particularly of one wonderful cash transfer where people who weren't expecting to get a cash transfer suddenly got one, <laughs> courtesy <laughs> of the phone company who uh, put 2,000 random, messed up 2,000 numbers. So uh, yeah, it's significant. The other thing is, um, what do we do with the information? The early warning systems for the 2011 drought in the Horn definitely worked. We all knew it was coming. And yet governments, aid agencies, donors responded late. Uh, I mean, this is a re recurring problem, um, but what, what uh, influence does this information actually give us to be able to mobilise people to act on what it's telling us? Great, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you're not the only one with dodgy technology. So, um, so the first question was about um, information management overload. Um, example given of Haiti, of actually so much coming in. And Liz, I think you touched on this, and then I wonder, perhaps Imogen might want to comment on it. Um, Yes, it's a really interesting question because I think um, overload is the challenge really in dealing with um, opening up and being more receptive to online communications and people being able to, to you know, bring forward data very, very quickly in real time, trying to translate that into something that can be useful for everybody. Um, I think actually it is the management of that that is key. And that is why the system does need coordinating. And I referred earlier to the need for structure. Um, and I think that actually there has to be a way of knowing what you need to know. So whilst people may pour in with, with information, um, sifting through that is, is the key. And there has to be some sort of coordinated way to do that. Um, certainly, that's a discussion we've been having with um, DHN recently on how do we actually know what to ask people for. Not um, everyone may not know what DHN is. Digital Humanitarian Network, which is um, uh, a network of networks of voluntary and technical communities. Um, so. Uh, you're probably none the wiser <laughs> from that <laughs> description. Um, but, it, it, but essentially the point being that, that it isn't just about getting more, it is about having a system of some description. And I think that uh, to answer the, 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 this earlier point, how far is that evolved with the potential of more um, communications and online information, I would say probably not nearly enough. Um, the report does point to the need for standards, and I would say there's there's real potential in using that to shape the structure of how we might work with all this, this volume of information. It's a fascinating mix, isn't it, of where you need structure and rigour, uh, but in order to enable the creativity. It's a, Imogen, do you want to comment on the question about information management, uh, given an OTRA perspective? Uh, and the perspective of someone who sat in Haiti for a year trying to um, open my emails, mostly. Uh, first comment, I think, is that uh, I think we have to be really honest. Uh, this information overload question is quite frequently largely self-generated. Um, if you are somebody working in the field right now, the, one of the problems with technology is that everybody at headquarters thinks they can call you up every 10 minutes and ask for a personal brief on exactly what is going on on the ground. And I can see a number of people smiling who've been on the, li on the receiving um, end of this. Uh, more seriously, I think that we are... F I think there's a, there's a deeper reason we're really struggling with this, and that is because the way in which information is moving now is fundamentally different. We as a humanitarian industry, and as Archer, we are command and control. The whole philosophy is how do you collect all this stuff in, put it into kind of a machine, and it pops out as an overview that is consistent, coherent, and is a, is a shared narrative that everybody can agree on of what is going on. Um, what Twitter and, f and uh, Facebook particularly, but Weibo in China do, they are many to many forms of information sharing. It is a fundamentally different way to allow information to move, which allows everybody the chance to go into this giant pool and just find what they need for themselves. And how we try and do, and whether we can even continue to do command and control um, management in a many to many information world is, I think, a very interesting question. For me, it's one of the reasons why we really struggle with the social media question, because we are trying to sort of take this stuff that's doing this and turn it into something that is doing this, that we can then do that. And it just, it just Twitter doesn't work like that. 
And if you watch, I think, the way that the media industry is adapting to social media, you get a very interesting and different take. The way that journalists have learned to use Twitter to sift Twitter in a given crisis to find the information they need and to be able to verify it quickly. Um, BBC has an entire user-generated content hub set up to do exactly this, um, and it's a very similar challenge. They're trying to do it against the clock in a situation where getting it wrong has massive consequences for many, many, many people. Um, then we can start to see that there are ways, there are other ways to approach this, but there is, there is an editorial side to this that is not going to go away. I think we're all looking really perplexed at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll build on these points. Let, let's let's move into. Um, well, I'm sure we'll come back to some of the stuff around information management. But moving on to the question from um, from Nev about the um, role of you know data protection, information security, and so on. I wondered if that's something I'm going to ask you first, Emily, just in terms of I'm thinking you <laughs> <laughs> just uh, in terms of the roots of your. Is that one of the issues you, that the your uh, magazine is talking about or to be honest no it isn't it's um it probably should be but it's one of those massive subjects that we've shied clear of slightly because there's also a political element to it and we're very much an apolitical publication um again working from the emergency services background i don't think they view the information in the same sort of way in the, uh, in terms of sensitivity we can understand the security aspects and the whole cyber security and cyber safety of certain you know attacks on um, infrastructure and communication and so forth but to be fair I haven't really looked at the um, at the actual issues behind okay. it okay. patrick sure i, I just wanted to um, briefly mention something that I, I, I see regularly on this topic, which is that just because the um, technology or the ability to collect data that is potentially ex useful um, exists doesn't mean that we should always do it if we cannot guarantee that it's done in a, in a way that, uh, that is ethical and, and guarantees um, some level of, uh, of uh, ownership and, and uh, understanding from the affected communities. In fact, at times it is quite fri frightening the amount of information and data that is collected about individuals at risk without any kind of consent, without any kind of agreement on how that information will be handled or should be, should be uh, distributed or not distributed, how much control do they have, um, is there any kind of consent? Now, I'm not trying to bring you know, academic level of uh, protection of human subjects in research, but there's certainly a lot of discussions that actually should happen between those fields because um, <clears throat> at, at times what we would not like to be done in our daily lives is accepted because it's a crisis, mm -hmm. because it's for good. But that's not a good enough justification. We have to be much more serious about how we, um, we, uh, we uh, approach these questions. I have one thing to add on that, if I may, which is that one thing I think we are also consistently very bad at um, when it comes to the security and the ethical issues is even trying to understand how communities themselves assess the risk of sharing information. Um, anybody who's lived in a conflict environment has a highly acute and sophisticated radar that is what tells them uh, whether or not they should share what they should share and and with whom and understanding how that risk how individuals carry out that risk analysis for themselves I'm thinking people using telephones and what they choose to on telephones in Syria right now um, that's that's a very sophisticated process and we tend to assume that populations are either totally ignorant of security concerns or completely incapable of analyzing them on their own I think we're going to take over. Um, just, <laughs> just want to add to that the um, because we were asking about some of the barriers and some of the issue, um, and and I think it touches on the uh, information overload to some extent, which is that um, humanitarian actors are in fact very concerned about sharing information, mm -hmm. sharing data. They're also not trust. Uh, they don't trust other sources of information but their own which many times leads to information overload because people collect multiple times the same information, share it to some extent, don't share it. I mean, these, these are really things that, that need to be worked, worked out. And the technology only makes the problem bigger because we collect more data. But, but it, it is a pre-existing condition, if I can say, and, and it's something that hasn't been cured for, for a long time. 
So a huge amount of work to be done there around uh, understanding about data protection, new sharing protocols, how we think about that in ways that work for the communities where we are actually actually working. The third question was then about training is all very well, but if the technology doesn't work, um, then kind of what's the point? Um, Paul, I mean, how many countries in the world have we got an issue with in terms of the infrastructure not being reliable and working? Um, how big is that problem? How quickly will it be fixed? Um, well, I mean, of, of course, there, there's always, when you're dealing with technology, there's always the, the issue of uh, the potential of, of services not being delivered as, as planned. But there's also sometimes as well some fantastic uh, unexpected consequences. I think one of, the, one of the consistent points in this report is that it's not about a magic technological pill to cure all ills, but that technology is there to strengthen and support and leverage what already exists. Uh, for me, I mean, if we talk about the area of communication, but you could also talk about the area of learning, it's about a blended approach. It's not about uh, just tweeting or just, uh, you know, having Wi-Fi uh, broadcasts to, to populations or with populations. It's about the whole mix of the communications uh, landscape that exists in the particular uh, context that you're working with. Somebody asked me once, and I often get it because in ITU we hold all the data about mobile penetration, etc. And people have often asked me, you know, what what type of technology uh, strategy should we have for country X? I said the only way to develop that strategy is to look at how people are using technology. It's that's how you'll get your strategy. Um, if I may reverse a little bit back to the former question, because I think it was it was it, there was a private sector aspect to it which I wanted to address. Uh, and Nev mentioned maybe it's a limitation in, in private sector relationship with, with all of the high profile cases we're looking at uh, linked to the problem with privacy of data. Um, I think that's, that's quite a different s story. I mean, th these are linked to international companies where there's not a global legal framework uh, applicable to how they're handling data and quite often in a, in a business relationship with customers who are sharing their data willingly. Um, d despite maybe not knowing all the consequences, I think in a humanitarian consequent in a humanitarian context, certain principles are totally non-negotiable. And this is one. I mean, I spent twelve years with the ICRC. This is one of the most uh, haloed principles there is: is the dignity of people themselves, and and absolute protection of their personal data. Now, having said that, working with private sector, I think, could actually strengthen that because you, you, the, the, the encryption ability of UBS Bank or of, of Google, can, uh, with all respect to my IT colleagues in the Red Cross, is, is far more sophisticated um, than, than what, what we could hope to deliver ourselves. The example in Haiti where, where we, we had a partnership with a telecommunications company, in the legal framework there, actually, we, we didn't have access to the data of the, the personal data of the clients themselves because these were clients of the telecommunication company which was lying behind this incredible wall of encryption that nobody could access, not even the operators in the field. All you could see were red dots representing people, no names, nothing. Um, and so I mean I think that, that the level of sophistication in terms of protection that we can get by partnering with private sector is quite significant compared to what we have today where we do this uh, bespoke solutions which are rarely standardized and not always effective and still still quite often based on paper. Great, thank you. Emily, you wanted to come in on? Just, just a couple of points there on the technology and techno technological failure and so on. I mean, one thing that I, I read into this that was quite interesting was um, the feedback that you get from affected, the feedback that you get from affected communities and so forth, and who actually has access to the technology. And one thing you want to make sure that you avoid is um, having had you avoid a scenario where the person who shouts the loudest and who has access to the technology is digitally elbowing other people aside to get their, you know, to get their message across and to get their wants and, and needs attended to. The other thing that was very interesting in the report was um, in Hurricane Sandy and after Fukushima was uh, handwritten notes. They work just as well as informing the, um, people about what's going on sometimes. And if there are, you know, and they were the only sources of information for certain sectors of the community. And I, you know, I think that you must, you know, there's always backup systems and they can be pretty robust and basic. Great. Um, and the final part of the question from over here was actually about, you know, acting on the early information in, wh in whatever form it actually comes. I mean, Liz, are you frustrated that no one's looking at your maps? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they are looking at our maps. Um, <laughs> 
But um, it's a fair point that I think sometimes people don't use what's there. Um, and so I think I would say let's, let's deal with those basics in a way before going on to more complicated things um, and make sure people do use it. And, and there are always reasons why people don't use material. It's either not relevant, it's in a language that isn't understood, um, it's come too late, or there are other pressures as to why people are making other decisions. And I think that it comes back to me in all of these situations, it's so often about the context and understanding that context really, really well. And that's everybody in it, whether it's the affected community, whether it's the, the humanitarian professional or you know, non-traditional responders, whoever it may be. I think understanding that context and trying to adapt our products to that is what's important rather than developing the products for its own sake. Mm. Right, thank you. Patrick. If I, I'll just comment on, on that and then uh, hand it over. Um, you know, I don't always love the term putting the community at the center. I mean, it's a, it's a bit gimmicky because we know how it is in the field and, and sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. At the same time, there is some valid point in there, which is that what we see happening is really a shift in traditional reporting mechanism. It is no longer the warning that goes to the head of office, that goes to the higher headquarter, that goes to the policy makers, but it's information being accessible and available for everyone to, to look at. And so the, the response gap is not going to change. That's always going to happen. But you now have communities that are better enabled or empowered to actually respond to the warning themselves because they have more access to the information. Um, so, so, so that is definitely having an impact. At the same time, it's not necessarily always a positive one. Um, and I can think of a couple of, uh, of examples. Uh, you know, one of them is, um, is um, we can very easily spread rumors and have communities take the wrong action just because they hear a warning, military group is coming or something like that, and then they actually will run in the wrong direction. So, so there is a lot of issues with this access to information and, and more democratized um, uh, system. It's not always that simple. The second issue is um, what what we, s I just used the word democratized information, and at the same time, what we also see is a very strong centralization of the information. So um, think about the general standing on, uh, on this hill and looking at the f battlefield and making the decisions, when in many ways that's what's happening now, because in the past when you were in, in uh, Pader, northern Uganda, you had to make the decision locally because well, your headquarter didn't know what was going on there, so you were empowered locally. But now your headquarter has actually access to all of that information, and so they don't need you to make the decision, they'll make it for you, and they have, there's that false sense of confidence mm -hmm. that we know what's going on in the ground, when in fact you're completely missing really local level information and, and understanding that you cannot gain by Twitter or, I mean, there's just in locally, Developed uh, knowledge that is um, that is uh, that is so important to take uh, to take into account. I just wanted to add on the the um, Somalia question because I think that is it's so true and that is such an important example. That was the most predicted crisis in the history of crisis, and so many people did nothing for so long. Um, I think in the context of talking about technology. Uh, and I do this quite a lot and write about it quite a lot and have done for a long time. It really strikes me how much of the language we use when we talk about the potential of technology is about empowerment, it's about the ability to listen, to connect with communities, to build relationships, participation, bottom up. This is language that's been around for decades. Let's not kid ourselves that technology is going to suddenly make us do it just because as we can, we've got a shiny tool to do it. The reasons that we do not do these things are institutional and political mm -hmm. and cultural and problems within our industry that have nothing to do with gadgets. And if we're not honest about that, then we are just going to set, our, set this whole thing up to fail because we'll decide technology is the answer to it all and then when technology doesn't deliver, we'll decide technology was useless and find something else to be excited about. But if we don't understand the structural reasons why we are not doing the things we think technology will enable us to do, then this will also fail. Yeah, that's a true reminder. Um, more questions? I have one at the back, well, two at the back here. Yeah, this lady here. 
<coughs> when it, it, it's, it's going to follow up what uh, Imogen just said. <laughs> I, I'm Nadia, I'm from uh, Oxford Brookes uh, University. I, I want to touch about um, uh, to the aspect of social media and digital humanitarian uh, networks. Um, in, in my own research for, for my master's degree, I looked at, the, at that aspect. And what I realized is that you have these groups, communities of online volunteers that they can do a lot of, uh, they can get a lot of information online, but you also have um, the, uh, the aid agencies who are not sure how they should use the product from the, the digital uh, humanitarian. So how, in the future, how can we bridge that gap? How can, can they work better together? Okay, great, thank you. Gentleman at the back. Thank you. I'd also uh, like to build on. Um, Could you say who you are? Oh, Samer yeah. Abdul Noor. I'm a doctoral researcher at the LSE. Um, some of the themes that were brought out. Um, I uh, like the the discussion about participation um, and and democracy. <laughs> the language around private public partnership and uh, the pub uh, private sector has also been around for some time. And from my experiences in the field, I've seen the private sector is already so embedded in the delivery of humanitarian uh, services, spe specifically in supply and logistics and in through consultancies and, and other services. So are we really talking about a new phenomenon of public sector, um, or sorry, private sector engagement? Um, and the discussion, it also relates, I think, to a dis the discussion on drones and military, which is probably understated in the report, but it's wonderful that it's mentioned. And so this, uh, I'm seeing this, or I sense this increased uh, or uh, an expediated convergence of private sector, uh, the military, and humanitarianism. Um, uh, one of those it certainly puts pressures on principles, but it also puts pressures on convergence and standardization. And so how does that, how will that increased uh, convergence and standardization um, uh, impact your the the need to respond to more situated, um, contextually dependent, um, you know, uh, instances of emergencies, etc. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Should you take one more lady at the front. Um, Elizabeth Blunt, Erin News. Um, I a lot of people have talked about these communities of digital volunteers and what they can do and how you handle them. I wondered if anybody had an example where they have used this kind of information source and what it was and what they did with it. Okay. Um, I'm going to just group, perhaps, Liz, do you want to pick up the question about use of digital volunteers and perhaps reflections on the social media and acting on the information coming from people in communities? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, to start with the last one then, digital volunteers. Um, uh, we are digital volunteers. Um, our team is a team of people who deploy on a volunteer basis. Um, so although they are professionals, and I think this is again where sometimes we have some assumptions about voluntary and technical communities, that somehow they're just a random group of people who are just interested in something without any background to it, that actually many of these people, both ours and others, who are online are indeed very, very skilled and knowledgeable and bringing those skills into the humanitarian context. Um, how we would typically work with that is when we source data at the beginning of an emergency and we go through a certain set of procedures to do that, um, part of that involves looking at what has been done already. Um, so, um, you know, there are examples, I'd have to ask my colleagues to give me the details, but examples of where we have used crisis mappers, maps, um, or data to start some of our analysis in certain situations. So, we do use it, but as I mentioned at the beginning, I don't think we are yet there in, in using it to the full, um, and I think we, we have further to go on how to do that. Um, I think... Uh, how do we, how can we work more together? I think that, that that kind of touches on the same question. 
for us, we're looking at how do we bring that into some sort of structure. And whilst I take Imogen's point that command and control may not be the way to go in this because it's a much bigger perspective, there are many more actors, there is something in when you're providing a service, you do need to have an output that's relevant. And that does involve some degree of analysis and processing. Um, and whilst it's not all necessarily coming into the centre, what we do need to do is go through a series of procedures to, to pull what we can together. And so I think that that's kind of what we're looking at, I think, in relation to online communities and the, the potential that's available through that. Um, at that doesn't in any way. I think the point that Paul made earlier, it is about a blend. These are only one part of the picture. It's not the full, the full picture. I don't think any of us would presume that it is. The other part of that second question was around, is there a tension between, I think, between standardisation and then the tailoring of information? I think is some of what you're getting at as well there, Liz. I mean, Imogen, do you want to comment on that in terms of, what, can these things coexist? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, sorry to think about this. Um, I think I mean, th what we're trying to do as humanitarians is to decide what has value for us and what doesn't, and how, as you said, how you put that in one place and analyze it so that we can make collective decisions because we're big organizations and we need to move lots of stuff around and that's just how we operate. For an individual, it's trying to find information on what is going on in the crisis. It's a fundamentally different process. Um, and that's where you see the micro level stuff, which you know, anybody knows about the Jalin Rapi project in Indonesia where um, it's <coughs> around a volcano in Java, and it's a whole network of local radio stations. Um, and in that kind of scale, you can have people calling in saying, um, we need food in this village, and someone else will phone up and say, okay, we'll come over and deliver you food. And it, 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 it's, it's all the simultaneous stuff going on at once. Um, I think it's an interesting question about how much we need to know about that, to know it's going on. Um, another interesting question about whether we should be supporting that, um, whether we should be trying to interact with it. I absolutely don't think we should be we should be trying to co-opt it um, uh, but the value judgments people make on information I think I have a huge issue with a concept that um, some of the digital humanitarian people use perhaps particularly of white noise um, the idea that you're looking for the for the data that that means something what you're actually looking for is the data that you've decided means something to you all the data that's out there means something to somebody. The tweets, the retweets, um, because communication is, is a cultural and social process. It's not, it's a way we engage. It's not just transfer of information. And as soon as you reduce communication to simply how you move information from A to B, you lose it. And that's why that comes back to my point earlier about the importance of face to face, because that's how you build trust and build a relationship. So the, the, the process by which Every, um, the reason I think social media is so successful in places like the Philippines um, in crisis situations in helping individuals organize their own responses is because it enables them to tap into what they need very quickly. Um, I actually think the Digital Humanitarian Network is awesome and that's not just because OCHA invented it. Um, it goes back to I think what Paul is saying about partnerships and how we create the interfaces between the existing humanitarian system and these newer groups. What, what OCHA and the Digital Humanitarian Network did, members came, it was come together and develop a code of conduct, develop a set of principles, develop a method for activating that network, and then create it into a portal that actually anybody, any organization can use. And the most recent activation I'm aware of is actually was actually by a small NGO in India um, in an area in which OCHA is not working because we don't do disaster response in India. They've got it under control. But um, it was a small Indian NGO who needed um, to get better maps of the area in which they were working because a lot of the villages weren't on the official maps. The official maps were simply out of date. Um, and because of the, the, the portal that had been invented, they were able to, to go to the digital humanitarian network and task them directly. And that, for me, is an awesome model because that's a core humanitarian organization developing a portal service that actually a small national NGO needs. It doesn't even have to be a big NGO or, or a UN agency. Um, I have used them, but I, I can come and tell you what I commissioned them to do. But that, I think, as, a, as not just digital stuff, but as a model for how we interact with other groups in disaster response is really interesting. 
I'm going to come back to you, Patrick. But Paul, do you want to comment on that in terms of both the question about the private sector, is it, so, is it really so new? And then that, this whole question about standardisation, what needs to be standard and what can then be enabled in the kind of ways that Imogen's talked about? Yeah, I mean, for sure the, the private sector have been involved in humanitarian action since the very beginning, since maybe even they were, maybe even they were precursors to humanitarian agencies uh, back, in, back in the day. But I think the, the relationship uh, we're talking about now and the topic we're talking about now, it's a very different relationship. We're talking not about, you know, Russian helicopter companies or Danish shipping companies or even local trucking companies. We're talking about global organizations uh, who are already present and have a network in the community. And you're also talking about a partnership where they would have a relationship with that community, which is un completely different to the previous one where the relationship is only with the agency. Um, and I think that's where the mind shift ne needs, to com needs to come. And, and I think it'll, it will happen because the the rules of the game, if you like, are changing because it's not it's not the, the, the aid agencies themselves that have the direct relationship with the communities anymore. Quite often you depend on telecommunication companies, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, like Safaricom, if you want to have a very efficient uh, distribution of mobile money in, in East Africa, you depend on the client base of Safaricom and the know-how of Safaricom. Otherwise, you basically won't be able to do it. So it's a very, very different relationship. So I think that's 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 where where it comes in. Um, on, on the other issues, uh, I mean, uh, you know, the, the the digital volunteers as well as you know how to better leverage social media, um, and even going back to the very first question on information management, I think I think there's one fundamental thing, and a number of panelists have have already sort of alluded to it or mentioned it directly, and again, it's about how the aid system itself is being disrupted. And I really, really believe that at the most senior level in organizations, on the board and at the executive management level of organizations, you absolutely need experienced and skilled technologists who can ensure that technology is used as strategy and not just as a tool and not just as a tactic, but that, you, that there's a strategic use of, of technology. So that, for instance, if you, if, if you have an information management issue, you don't actually see it as an issue. You see it as an opportunity uh, to learn, for the organization to learn from all of the data it's sitting on. God knows the amount of valuable data some organizations are sitting on that they've been around for, for decades that could really improve their effectiveness. Um, on, on the digital volunteers one, um, uh, that's that's a very new phenomenon. I think it really became uh, became prevalent in Haiti. But just to mention one thing about it, I think what's very interesting about that as well is that how organisations like Ocha who have used them, and there's a there's a colleague of Imogen's called Andre Verity who wrote a blog about <laughs> it, um, showing how using the digital volunteer network actually changed very much the internal working systems of the organisation itself. And I think that was really. The maybe one of the most important contributions they made because that's exactly what's needed mm -hmm. because aid organizations the aid model hasn't changed too much in a long long time and it needs to change uh, to keep a pace of all of these opportunities and expectations from communities and communities taking more and more the lead in defining their own uh, their their own destiny if you like great patrick do you want to pick up some of these points that you wanted to come in and also one of the questions drones were mentioned earlier and one of the questions we've got um, from the online communities, from Nadim, um, who is, how do you mitigate the security and spying concerns develop developing countries have regarding the use of technology for disaster management? Uh, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the first comment I wanted to do is, is, I think, runs across many of the questions that, that have been raised. I mean, um, and, and in fact, I want to revisit that, that question of efficiency that I mentioned before. Because we hear about data overload, about data sharing, about all the challenges coming from technology, but the challenge is that humanitarians are actually not very good at collecting and using information and data, um, regardless of the technology. And, and so the question is, is um, how do we count refugees? We're not very good at it. How do we assess information so that we know what is needed where? Uh, we're not very good at it. How do we collect that information so that it, it is good enough to monitor over time the impact that we're having if we're doing any progress? We're not very good at doing that either. So technology is only there because that challenges exist. Can it help? Probably yes. I would argue yes that it can. Is it creating new challenges in the process? Yes, as well. But again, the underlying question is, 
how do we get humanitarians to better use data and information in 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 the process and and technology is only enabling an, uh, uh, an answer to that um, to that question on the on the drones and the perception i mean um I, I don't have an answer. I mean, all I know is yes, we need to look at it very carefully and systematically. And it's it sounds like a generic thing, but but it's not being done. And drones are being put into operations. Um, Monusco has acquired drones. I don't think they are deployed yet in uh, in eastern Congo, but but it will happen. Um, mix that with the the increased you know military role. You you've got this uh, this. Um, merging of uh, are we humanitarians are we uh, military actors are we uh, peacekeepers uh, we're all facing that questions and remember that for communities at risk they don't necessarily dis distinguish between the uh, I ifrc or the, the red cross and the ngo and the un they are just the actors responding and so we're all in the same boat and and so if one actor acts in a way that is not seen as neutral or that is seen as as um, you know, being too close to a military operation or something, it creates a problem for everyone. And and so we need to re-emphasize those, those principles. And as much as all the new actors are welcome and by all means are contributing fantastically to the to, to uh, humanitarian action, we need to be very cautious about what they do and how they are doing it and create forums so that experience can be shared. Uh, human rights community, humanitarians have learned for decades on how to operate in these these complex um, uh, contexts, um, w it's it's time to be much better at sharing that um, that uh, those lessons learned. Good. Well, we're almost out of time. I'm going to give each of the panel members 20 seconds to say that make their final point, their biggest, the thing they're most excited about or most worried about. Um, and I'm glad to see that you're all hopefully tweeting away rather than checking on what's on at the cinema. Um, and because I should have said a key performance indicator for this event is the number of tweets we managed to generate. Um, but um, Paul, do you feel able to chip in your final 20 seconds of wisdom? Well, um, I hope I, I, I don't steal the key message of any of my, my fellow panelists, because I think we would all very much uh, be of, of the mindset that it's, it's and, and Patrick mentioned it uh, 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 during his his, his presentation, it's not about technology, it's, it's about people. Um, and I think that the, the, the developments in technology that we're witnessing today give us an opportunity as humanitarian organizations and development actors to bring us back to the core of our mission and our values, which is really to facilitate communities to develop their own solutions and find their own uh, their, 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 to address the issues that are affecting their communities and to ensure that they are the ones who are the first responders, that they are the ones leading the aid effort. Um, and basically with, with the power of technology today to really engage with communities, be it through social media or mobile telecommunications and many other forms of communication, um, we're, we have no excuse anymore. I mean, it is, it is really a, a possibility to ensure the communities take the lead in humanitarian action and that aid agencies become much more the facilitators and the connectors um, and leveraging or le leveraging technology to do that. Great. Liz? Um, I think for me the, the exciting thing is thinking about the partnership potential that comes out of this report and um, the opportunities that technologies in the broadest sense can, can offer. Um, and I think that that's a partnership that's, uh, I mean, it's not new to us working in partnership is something that I think we've all been doing for a long time, but it's about different types of partners um, and maybe a bit more of a meeting of equals in those partnerships. And I think that's the thing that is the shift for us in, in the humanitarian context. I think for me it comes back down to human factors and behaviour and the diversity of human likes, dislikes, the understanding of technology, preferences, culture and history. And then take that and replicate it across all the actors and institutions involved in the humanitarian field, which shows quite how um, daunting it can sometimes be with the mass of information and technology available. But it's overwhelmingly positive and it really is how they all work together and how they use the information. And But over trying to overcome any difficulties because we can't sweep them under the carpet or ignore them. Right. I've got an image and then come back to Patrick. I'm really glad Paul said that because obviously I agree with him. It means I don't have to. Um, I think the thing I keep coming back to is 
all these reports. It's not about us anymore. That's the single biggest thing for me. I mean, mobile phone companies are responders. The people who are going to solve the digital divide problem is Google and Facebook, and they've publicly taken on the challenge. Diaspora's put more money into responses um, than we do. Google People Finder is overtaking Red Cross family re relocation work in many, many countries. We're s this is not, this whole, it's not about us. And as long as we keep thinking it is about us, we're not going to find our space in it. Right. Uh, I was going to say something about us, so it's a little hard after <laughs> this. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I was going to say is um, we, we are very much all taking the field as a, as a very large experiment. We're rolling out and trying out technology. Uh, things that sometimes don't work really well that uh, are buggy and, and, and we throw the technology out and, and see what comes out of it. And, um, and, and in some ways it's good because whatever sticks is, is going to be used and, and we can learn from that. But at the same time we are dealing with people and what we're doing has implications. Um, we get people to take risks because we decide that they can send an SMS that has names and we can post it online. So, so we need to be, again, very, very cautious and, and very systematic in how we're doing that. To some extent, experiment is good, but we cannot just have the kind of jungle that is right now. So yeah, that would be my last one. So thank you. Um, my final reflection, well, I think it's been an incredibly rich debate. I was actually very taken by what Paul said about the aid system has been disrupted. Mm. Um, and actually, we've got to think entirely differently about ourselves. And again, as Imogen said, it's not about us, but if we don't, and if we think about it that way, we won't actually find our place. Um, and actually, you know, the challenges for leaders as well within organizations and actually the digital capability and understanding to understand that the ways in which technology can make a difference and the other interesting thing about a report like this is that some of the trends we're dealing with and in world disasters reports over the years are moving relatively slowly I suspect we might write a different report in a year's, year's time with a whole bunch of new examples about the way in which technology is being harnessed and the ways in which protocols um, are being developed for its use um, it only remains for me to thank the speakers um, uh, for all your incredibly rich contributions and for traveling far and wide actually to be here. Um, and to remind everyone that there will be a video and audio recording um, from this event, which will be online within 48 hours, um, as well as the video. So I'd just like you to join me in thanking the panel for a fantastic debate. Thank you. Thank you.